So between that, my kind of background um, starts as being a computer science scholar in a sense. So I studied computer science and worked in statistical analysis. So these kind of things. And um, I thought this is not really enough because it doesn't really, it doesn't really. I mean, it makes sense, but it's just not for me. And um, I started to go into the direction of media art and started to study media art. And um, these kind of things. So this was kind of an installation I did, well it was this year, um, and coming from, from statistical analysis, which has a lot to do with space, um, <coughs> my art has a lot to do with space perception, like how you as a human being um, perceive the space which is around you. Um, so I started kind of with mathematics, ended up with interactive installations, and at some point also discovered well, that, well, I mean, games, they're not that far away from it. Um, but I will come back to that later. Um, just to give you an impression maybe of what I'm doing, is um, that was one of the last projects that I've been doing. Uh, it's a project, a game that was called Duality. And I guess I'll just show the video. Um, so it's basically, it looks like a kind of two-player game, which is not. So it's just a game pretty much based on, on two screens. Um, the objective of the game, it looks like a, what you saw, so one thing there. Uh, it looks like, a, like an old-school platform game, but it's not. So these, these two worlds and these two screens, they differ only slightly, and you can only solve the levels. Um, if you think about what happens if you're doing one thing on the one world and one thing in the other world. And um, that was shown on a festival uh, about game and art. And the interesting finding was that um, people interested in art got it really easily and they were really, really kind of amazed by it. Um, but people who were more out of the, um, out of the uh, gaming scene, um, they really got pissed off because their ideas about how games works uh, how, how games work and how a game should be, um, it didn't meet their kind of requirements for games. So, there again. Um, well, that was pretty much like one the screen. So you had these two worlds and um, you had to solve them at the same time. However, um, so the thing is, and the question that, like for me was, um, are interactive installations games or is it just, is it a kind of a subgenre or um, where's the borderline there? And um, I brought some examples. It's just this. This is like just a very, very short thing that I did this year um, here in Berlin for Social Media Week, which is just like a pretty much a, a small audiovisual installation. Um, this is most certainly not a game because it's, it just reacts on what you're doing, but that's all of it. So there's there's no game-like elements, no game mechanics in there. Um, but this is a very interesting game from 2011, I don't know if you see it, um, which was done by Michael Fielding uh, in Karlsruhe, where I also studied. Um, this was played by, um, with two controllers, so people could play against each other, and uh, the whole goal of the game was to impress this little duck. <laughs> and impressing worked with, um, one party could, uh, was able to, to control here these frogs, and the other with these these apes, and uh, as soon as you were you were pressing a button on your on your controller, um, these eyes started to flash, and whoever party 
uh, was, was doing the, the strangest, um, strangest patterns of uh, flashing eyes, was impressing this, this small duck and it started to glow and to creak. And, uh, so it was pretty funny. But also the question was like, is this a game? Like, what, what's happening there? Because it was pretty, a pretty simple pattern that you had to, to press. And as soon as people got to know that, kind of the idea of playing against each other, um, well, didn't really make sense anymore. Um, so going to another, another audiovisual installation that happened this year, actually in Cologne, on a festival called Platine, who was uh, from a few friends of mine at Bild und Tonfabrik. So they did kind of an audiovisual projection on the, uh, I think it was called the Gilders Forum in Cologne. And um, people who were nearby, they could pretty much, by just surfing a web page, they could change whatever is happening there. I was kind of, it had shared game-like features, but the question was still like, what is that? Is that game? So it, it, this was shown on a game festival. Um, and also the same, same problem is like, what with art, uh, with art, so with augmented reality games, or alternate reality games like Majestic, maybe, one of the first. So also, uh, how do they serve as games? Um, what kind of game-like qualities do they share? So maybe one of the first biggest questions there is games, does games equal art? Well, obviously some do, and I will not go into these of Proteus because I think the last time I was here people, well, the take, take the next one probably. Um, so mm -hmm. Dear Esther, um, some of you also again will say, well, this is not really a game. Um, I was just actually talking to the creative director he says it's a game, and he has good reasons for it. <laughs> no, seriously. Um, and well, I think I think it is a game, and it shares a lot of a lot of aesthetic quality. So it, is, it looks nice. Um, this is a game. I don't know if anybody has ever seen that. It's called The Plan by Krillbite. It was shown on the Not Games Fest this year in Cologne. Also. Um, so you control this little fly. You just fly around. And there's no, like there's one objective, which is just to fly around. And you will at some point start to fly to the top, and then things happen. Well, I will not. I will not spoil it. Um, and also, a very very important game, which is obviously an artistic game, is Paint Station. Mm -hmm. who's, who's played who played Paint Station? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay. laughs> More than one time. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So, um, I think the important thing here is um, that if you want equal games and art, then it's not only important how the implementation looks like, but what's the concept behind your game? What are you like? What are you addressing? Because the most very fancy-looking 3D games, I wouldn't ever consider calling art. And we just talked about uh, GTA V, um, and this doesn't qualify. At least from my perspective, it doesn't qualify as art. Um, so the question here is, what are art games? Um, I guess one of the first things is, um, art always raises questions instead of answering them. So um, does your game, at some point, raise questions? Uncomfortable questions, questions people don't want to think about, because it just make them like not happy. Um, then also art addresses hard topics, so it addresses topics that are hard to describe in words, hard to um, describe with terms that you already know. Um, does your game do that? Like, what is that here? What is, it? What, what is the difference between art and, art and game here? Um, and then if you're creating the game, is your person, in a sense, directly involved in this creation of the game, like, is there some some part of your personality um, inside of this game? Because art is always an externalization of something that's kind of inside you that you want to let out. So it's always connected to the developer. There on a um, to the it's connected to the feelings, to the thoughts, to this inner personality of the developer of the artist. And also, one important thing is probably. Um, that you should not be afraid that if you want to, or if you're creating games that you want to serve, want to have what called artistic games, don't be afraid to deconstruct the realities of other people or even of your own. And this is, um, it goes into the same direction as raise uncomfortable questions. 
which is really address topics that are important that are kind of life changing. And don't get me wrong with that number, I'm not like really don't want to stick to it, but if you focus more than X percent of your time on on visual sound or interaction design, then it's not art. So um, if your concept isn't the most important part of your uh, what you're doing, um, then well think about if you could change something. Or think about if you think or if you like believe it qualifies as art. Um, however, um, the thing is, I mean, being an artist, everybody can say, well, I'm an artist, and basically it is it's just a decision to say that. So if you're an artist now, like, what's your, what do you have to expect? What, is your, um, like, what would your life look like? Um, well, it will be a lot of work. So this is kind of from um, an artist's journal. And it's just dedicated, or this, this issue is just dedicated about we, are, we work too much and um, I guess everybody in here knows it pretty much. Um, we are all working a lot. And uh, all of us have this problem that some of the boundaries between work and private life are blurring, whatever you're doing, if you're doing it really with your heart, with your passion, then well, it becomes your life. Um, so the question is, is that for me? And the next question is, okay, what do I have to expect? Well, yeah, you will fail. Like, you will totally fail at all times. Like, if I'm doing stuff and I'm doing this full time right now, uh, I'm failing just all the time and losing a lot of money until I get to a point where I make money again and then I'm losing a lot of money again. So, pretty much, it's startup life, right? Makes sense. I guess that's the same thing. Um, I would say yes, just without the business development stuff. Uh, <laughs> Mm -hmm. I've done startup, so I, I think I'm qualified to say that, but never mind. Um, so one important thing, if you're, um, well, if you're working as an artist, of course, is exhibiting, like get your stuff out, get people to know you, show what you, what you do, show what you're working on. And the important step there is uh, just apply for festivals, for example, for this one, <laughs> once again. Um, besides building a network around curators, around these people who do these festivals and who are just involved in that like on a daily basis, or get in touch with, um, there's another one, also a very, very good one actually, in our festival of UCLA. Um, I think it takes place every May, I'm not sure. I think it's always around the same time um, in the States. And, um, or another, another important things are these um, game labs. So it's basically, um, these are kind of parts of universities, of art universities, or, or, or art faculties. So we have this Cologne game lab, which is a pretty good one, um, and game lab council. I mean, it, it's far away, it's not basically here in Berlin. But these places are just uh, full of people who are interested in that, and who are also just coming from an artistic background. They also usually lack development skills, because they are artists, and don't have an IT background at all. Um, so they also have something something to offer because they also want some want something from you. If you're a developer they, they need you at the same time. And they have good ideas also. Um, and of course go to events near you like this one. So that's actually a pretty good thing to do. And um, one of the good things if you exhibit, like if you really put your stuff in on a venue where you can um, where you just show it to people is that you can control pretty much everything. You can influence every single parameter. Like you know the volume of the headphones when you're when they play your game. So you can really work with that. So you can create games or you can you can, you can um, take control over different parts of your game that you couldn't do if you just give it to your your client or just give it to the um, to the people outside and say, well, play my game. Um, so you can even play with the fact that it's high volume um, and you have to have to listen to it high volume. Um, so it's the same thing with a paint machine. If you would have paint machine, paint machine, paint station. If you would have paint station, um, like on at home, and you would just like cut the wires, then things wouldn't make sense anymore. Um, so you can influence pretty much everything if you have it um, um, on your exhibition. The 
problem is then if you want to convert it to a game which you want to spread around, which you want to want to get out into the world, that you have to like take a lot of a lot of effort to, to change these things again and to like make sure everybody can play it on every machine uh, with every operating system or just the operating systems you want them to and all these things. So um, this is really a good thing about exhibiting these kind of games because um, you can really focus on just creating your game and not on all this stuff around. You don't need any frameworks, you just build the game and just see what's happening. Um, so, well, one of the good things, you can really get money from that. So, um, well, the <coughs> key word here is commissions, which is basically what I'm living on. Um, so the idea is you get money, food, beer, and nights in hotels for just doing the stuff you're always doing. Um, you have to give talks, maybe, but, um, well. Uh, so people give you money for, for creating works for festivals. You just create the works, or, or adapt the works, bring them to the festivals, and whatever. There you are. Um, the bad thing about it is that it's usually hard to get. So you have to know people, or you have to win prizes at festivals where they, like, I don't know, the maze just gives out the prizes if you really win. Other festivals give out artist fees, like some money if you just get selected as, well, not finalist, but pre-finalist or something. Um, so that's kind of always a, always a, a good deal that you can do. But it's, it's, there are these, these, um, um, these things where people just come to you and say, hey, that's my festival, I want you, because I saw your work, I want you to create something or to show something on my festival, I give you here, here here's um, your flight tickets, and here's a thousand euros, and just come there and do it. Um, but for that, you have to like you have to show stuff before. People have to know you. People have to know who you are. So, most important thing, right, uh, again, is get out. And well, you have to invest money first to get out. So it's always always this kind of trade-off. You have to, to be there um, to get found, basically. And then there's this chance that you could get into a museum. Like you have your stuff at, at MoMA in the big game, well, no, not at MoMA. Um, <laughs> so you can have your game somewhere and people can play like all the time. It's a, in a permanent exhibition. Like this, for example. This is the, well, it's actually at the ZKM in Karlsruhe. It's, uh, they opened up a new um, art games um, part of the exhibition. It's a permanent exhibition. And, I think it ran the last 20 years, they just redesigned it and opened it up again. And um, also curators will come to you when they want you to play, and there's no way to apply for that. It's just, if people want you to, well, to present there, you can present there, you should do that. And um, the bad thing is, whatever you've done before, if you have to create it, if you have to, have to present it on such occasion, it has to be bulletproof, you have to have spend a lot of extra work, like weeks or months, just to make it completely bulletproof. Um, because people will, will tamper with it, and people will try to do everything to manipulate, to destroy it. They even, they even steal these things, these controllers. It's insane. Just give, people, just give people like five minutes of free time, and they will do anything to destroy whatever you did. It's crazy. And talk. Like, do the same thing I did right now. Um, because I also was not kind of invited here, but I, I was here, I think, three or four months ago on the, on the last, but the one before, I think, the second talk and play. I just thought, well, that's a good thing, and I want to support it, because I think, well, we all got something to say, or at least a little thing, and uh, we'll just go here and talk. Um, so talk about your games, or talk about kind of how you work to create games, because I think the most important thing here is to inspire all of us to just do stuff. Because we can talk about that the whole time, but it's important that we really, really do in the end. Um, or just don't go to talk and play about anywhere else. I think there's more serious of these things. No! I don't know. Not in Berlin. They told me to come here. here. It's only these and I'm amazed. I'm God. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that. That's crazy. And if you're more into the techie, whatever techie thing, um, then there's also games and science. So there's a lot of um, a lot of conferences uh, which deal with games, not only game studies, but a lot of um, um, a lot of different different aspects of games on a kind of scientific level. And oh, um, 
for example, the um, DGRA conference um, or ACM ZIGRA, probably, probably people heard of that. If you're coming from a, from an IT background, this is kind of the computer science and art slash visual design games, movies, conference. Um, these things cost a lot of money. Let's see, let's see. Um, well, um, the not so nice part of it. Um, but first of all, you meet a lot of people who have money, which is good, and you meet a lot of people. Um, well, you meet a lot of people, so um, it gives you again more uh, more audience, and um, well, people will get to notice you, or hopefully get to notice you. Um, so one of them, for example, is this one. Um, it's interesting because there is a game design competition, and they first for the first time ever focus really and want to have. People send in their games, and they have a deadline on 7th of January, but they even finance you to get there. So, it's, and I don't think a lot of people will apply there. I just don't think so. And they call it student work. So, if you happen to have a student ID or know somebody who has or are willing to spend 150 euros for um, what is it? Um, well, enrollment fee, then you have a student ID afterwards. And it doesn't matter what your student like. Just go. I heard University of Greifswald is uh, very easy to get in. <laughs> <laughs> why, why don't you think a lot of people will apply? Um, because, first of all, they had three or four deadlines already. They just passed and they just kept on having that open. That's a bad sign. Or a good sign if you want that. And um, it's a very these, these conferences, especially this chi conference, is, um, is very scientific and they're doing it for the first time, so it's um, um, they will not have a lot of people there. So you think they are desperate but very cool? Yes. Right? Okay. <laughs> I don't know if they are very. They are usually very cool. These, these things. They have good buffet. Where is it again? This one will be in Vancouver. Hmm. So if you happen to be there. But I guess I think if, if you get selected, they will fly you. They, they will fund at least parts of it, part of your journey. You will probably have to pay for this. <laughs> um, so in the end, I think the most important part is just do whatever you love. And um, being an artist or like doing these things, creating games. I mean, you all know it. Um, it just sucks away all of your time, everything you have. And uh, well, but just in the end, if there's a bunch of people standing around your game on a festival where it's lots of other games but kind of your game is the coolest and this is a very very nice thing to be and a very nice place if you're standing there and you're not revealing that you're somehow connected to this artwork people are really having like an honest opinion and um, that's actually a pretty cool thing um, so for me I wouldn't do anything else I guess even though I would not consider myself at all being a game developer or designer but that's kind of one of the things that I like for myself, saw as being a very valuable experience to well, focus on on this game design part of what I'm doing. <laughs>